Dr. Bob Salas drops hints throughout this interview on how your fitness business and the entire fitness industry can be more attractive to the 80% of people who are not exercising. Welcome to Thinking Ahead by the Fitness Business Podcast. And I'm not your show host, Jason Stoll. I'm Justin Tamsett, your stand-in host. Jason will be back in 2021 with great guests for our Thinking Ahead show. And this is a show where our guests want you to think and hope that they inspire you to turn ideas into actions. The Thinking Ahead show, it's designed to have you think about ideas, concepts or strategies that will enhance your business. We want to plant an acorn seed with you. We want to give you the resources to fertilise that seed so it becomes a huge oak tree. We guarantee you'll hear ideas that are not currently trending as we want you ahead of the curve, setting trends, not following trends. And today I was blessed and you're about to hear my interview with Dr. Bob Salas. Dr. Salas is a family physician practicing at Kaiser Permente Medical Center in Fontana, California, where he serves as co-director of the Sports Medicine Fellowship Program. He's a clinical professor of family medicine at the University of California. He's a past president of the American College of Sports Medicine and currently chairs Exercise is Medicine, a joint initiative of ACSM and the American Medical Association. He's also chaired the healthcare sector of the US Physical Activity Plan and is the physician spokesperson for the Everybody Walk campaign. After the interview, Bob told me having the medical fraternity buy into exercise as medicine was actually the easy bit. He said the fitness industry was the hard one. And from the outside looking into our industry, wait until you hear what he thinks of the current fitness industry marketing strategies. He will hit you right between the eyes with what I'm going to call a reality arrow. He wants to send his patients to do strength training. He just needs somewhere that they feel comfortable and will welcome them. Finally, he shares the real reason why he thinks people should go to their gym, their club, or even a CrossFit box. And it will cost you zero to implement. Enjoy the interview with Dr. Bob Salas as he gets you thinking ahead. In October 2008 press conference, you asked US physicians to include an exercise prescription in all their treatment plans. In fact, you went on to describe exercise as a wonder drug. Now, many governments across the globe in 2020 allowed people to exercise for reasons additional to the ones that you actually listed back in 2008, mainly with that focus on mental health. So for over 12 years, you've preached the mantra, exercise is medicine. And today, I really want to pick your brain, Dr. Bob, on the future of exercise is medicine in the fitness industry. So did you actually see exercise as medicine take off between 2008 and 2020, 2019? Yeah, I think the concept has really taken off. I think everybody agrees with it. It's been really a pretty easy sell, particularly to the medical community. The difficulty has been trying to fit it into the healthcare paradigm because there is just this overwhelming focus on pills and procedures and anything that is not one of the, one of those two things and usually very expensive just has no advocacy. And, uh, you know, there's virtually no funding to try to move these kind of initiatives through when you compare them to pharmaceuticals and to procedure devices. They've just got infinitesimal funding, you know, or they just got astronomical funding. Whereas, you know, we're just no, I, I reckon they've got infinitesimal funding. It just keeps coming. It doesn't. Yeah. It? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it, it, they're, they're basically printing money these days, but um, yeah, it's a bit frustrating to try to get this heard and even accepted where everybody agrees with it, but we've got this and this and this. And yet when they have a new drug for depression, suddenly they can mandate that we screen every patient for depression, you know? And, and it's never 
never the discussion when screening that patient for depression is what maybe we should have them exercise. It's always put them on this drug, you know, and that's it's just the world we live in. It's just it, that's been the most frustrating thing is everybody agrees with it. Well, how do we we just got too many competing interests and mostly it's pharmaceutical that just always seems to win out. Are you seeing from your experience um, a generational shift with doctors as well, like perhaps doctors who are who are younger, who have grown up, perhaps exercising more than more mature doctors who oh, are used to giving a, a pill prescription? Is there a is there a changing of the guard there, or is it still being driven? Yeah, I don't. I, I couldn't say for sure that I would say that. Oh, the younger doctors are much more receptive than the older doctors. You think about this younger generation; they grew up with pretty much no PE in their schools. I mean, they didn't have to do PE, and they've de-emphasized that. They've taken physical education out of most colleges and universities. You can't take physical education for credit anymore at most universities. So I don't know that this younger generation suddenly gets it uh, any more than the older one does. The older generation sort of very much entrenched into the medical model of you come to the doctor, you tell them your symptoms and I give you a prescription, you know? And so I, I don't know, they both have pluses and minuses. I don't know that I see a big shift that's suddenly going to turn the tide. And throughout 2020, and I'm going to guess into 2021, we have seen, um, the hashtag trending across multiple platforms, exercise is medicine, um, yeah. as we fought the, the coronavirus pandemic and using exercise as medicine just for almost personal health. Um, that must have made you pretty proud to see that popping up everywhere. Yeah, I, I um, you know, it's interesting because we're, we're paying the price now for many years of unhealthy lifestyle you know, and, and exercise is at the heart of reversing the conditions, which are really the major risk factors for developing severe COVID. And interestingly, I've looked at data, you know, we ask every patient in our practice where I work uh, about their exercise habits, and I'm finding amazing correlations between patients who have self-reported they're active and whether or not when they get COVID, if they end up in the hospital, if they end up on a ventilator, if they end up dead, um, those who yeah. exercise do much better. I haven't published this yet, but it's it's coming. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, and do you think, I mean, is exercise really, I mean, there's, for me, there's a difference between exercise and fitness. Exercise is, is kind of moving, isn't it? And fitness is, is that the next level? Is that how you would define it? Well, fitness is really sort of the end effect of exercise. And it's something we can tangibly measure a person's level of fitness and we know there's great correlation with a person's level of fitness and their risk for various chronic diseases, their likelihood they're going to live longer. But we also know there's a lot of people who can train the same amount and maybe don't. Fitness is somewhat genetic. And so, uh, you, you know, in the other, at the end of the day, um, I'm going to prescribe exercise, not fitness. I'm not going to say go out and get your fitness level to this area. That's just not a practical solution. So there's been a lot of debate. Clearly, fitness is the best measure and best predictor of health. But um, we also know that the best correlation with one's fitness is how much activity they do. And so for me, um, it's just not practical to measure their fitness in a clinical setting, but I can at least assess their exercise by asking them about it. Now, Obviously, with all self-reported measurement, it's subject to bias. Uh, you know, we, we know that if you, you know, you ask a, a, a man how tall he is, he'll always exaggerate. If you ask a woman how much she weighs, she'll always underestimate. You know, it's, we, we know people underestimate similar, in a similar fashion. When a patient tells me they smoke a pack a day, it's usually two packs a day. Or if they have two to three drinks, it's probably six to eight drinks. I mean, we just, we know that. But um, I still think it's the best we can do. I do think and, we, we, you know, sort of at the heart of this exercise is medicine idea was really that every patient get asked their exercise habits and they make a formal exercise prescription. Um, I've always thought of that self-reported number as being a placeholder right. or, you know, we're walking around with, uh, you know, I, I know my steps every day because I carry this with me all the time. And I, I really envision that we're going to with cell phones being in, in watches that pretty much every's carrying, everybody's carrying an activity monitor, we ought to be able to upload that data into charts. And, and that's, I, I think, would be nice to have more objective data. But still, the whole idea of exercise as medicine was to get it in the exam room. And at least when we do a physical activity vital sign, um, it's in the exam room, it's being asked of patients, and that's really what we want to happen. 
So if we know that exercise improves people's health and what has been fascinating, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but as some countries are coming out of COVID and then going back or coming out or wherever they are in that, mm-hmm. that pandemic um, timeline and people are coming into joining gyms, you'd be fascinated to know that lots of people are now coming in and actually saying, I want to join a gym to improve my health. Wow. That's like great. Pre 2020, I would suggest 95% of members were coming into run a marathon, lose mm. weight, bench press 250. But now there's a, there's a swinging majority coming in saying, I want to improve my health, mm-hmm. which I think is really exciting for us. But how does the fitness industry, um, from an outsider's perspective and a, and, a, and a medical perspective and professional, how does the fitness industry um, become a or even the viable option for exercising for these medical purposes or for these health reasons? Well, you know, I I think you can quote the data better than me, but going back the fitness industry, the number of people who actually belong to a gym has not changed, right? My understanding is about 18, 19% for 20, 25 years. And the entire fitness industry spends all its money trying to steal membership from one gym and get it to their gym. Why aren't they? Tr- why is not the fitness industry trying to go after a new demographic? And and let's face it, when I have a patient in my office who belongs to a gym, I'm almost never worried about them. How really? do I get? How do? Yeah, they're they're usually always healthy. I mean, and, and and so we've we've had this idea of well, maybe we should pay for gym memberships for we just be end up paying for the ones who don't even who are going to pay it anyway. You know, it's how does the gym recreate itself, reimagine itself? to be attractive to a middle-aged, overweight diabetic, you know, uh, or somebody who has heart disease that could frankly walk into a gym and be intimidated to wear, you know, a workout clothing. Um, I, I think that's the really the challenge to the gyms is to reinvent themselves to change that demographic from that 18% that they're stuck on and expand it. And I would hope that the message that exercises medicine uh, when we get through this pandemic, which has clearly exploited our unhealthy lifestyles. I mean, let's face it, the ones who are ending up in the hospital on ventilators and dying, the va- virtually all have underlying chronic diseases. And for the most part, these are all diseases of inactivity. And so when we come back from this to try to set ourselves up to survive the next one, we're going to have to change these lifestyles, these behaviors. And I think gyms have a tremendous opportunity to position themselves to be that solution. It, it's fascinating you talk about that because I've never, I actually haven't heard anyone say that previously because we talk about um, historically and even moving ahead that lifestyle uh, impacts our health. But the way you just described it is that our lifestyle it, if and when a pandemic comes, all of a sudden shows our Achilles heel. Yeah, the ability to survive a pandemic, certainly COVID, most depend, is, has been most dependent on your lifestyle leading up to it pre-COVID. If you led an unhealthy lifestyle and you suffered from the diseases, particularly the diseases of inactivity, because I think it's the most powerful factor, um, you, you're tremendously at risk. And we're seeing that. And um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to take heed of that and pay attention to it. And it's never too late to try to improve your chances for surviving COVID, but there's going to probably be another one coming and we need to have that in mind. You, you mentioned before about the, the clothing side of things when, when some of these overweight people or unhealthy people come, come into gyms. And when we talk about gyms, I mean, we've got everything from a 300 to 400 dollar a month um, mm-hmm. health club all the way down to a, a big box club we've got yoga studios crossfit boxes i mean we've got even people doing stuff in their lounge rooms these days in relation to to exercise um is there there's there's no preference moving is the most important thing but what other intimidation factors do you see that if we were thinking ahead to get into that 80 percent 
what what things do you see that we perhaps need to improve, get rid of, or enhance? Yeah, um, I, I think setting things up for, uh, specifically for patients who are very novice and perhaps have some disability, chronic disease. You know, it's interesting. I I've been the most amazed at the ability of a gym that's focuses on this to have tremendously positive effects on people that are the most sick. They have the most to gain. If you take somebody who has in-stage congestive heart failure, who has severe lung disease, who maybe has Parkinson's disease, and we've shown that putting these patients on, a, on an exercise program has tremendous effects. I mean, you really, and we've known that, that you get the most bang for the buck taking somebody who's really doing nothing and just getting them to do little a bits. And to go farther, the curve starts to flatten out. The real bang for the buck is just getting people a little bit active. And, and I've been astounded by um, the, the positive effects and how much we can improve and, and save money by reducing hospitalizations and things in patients with re really serious illness. And as an example, I, I, I've done a lot of work with my local club called the Claremont Club. And I, I know you know Mike Alpert, who's yes, uh, just an amazing disciple. He, he's bought the whole thing. You know, I, I've been preaching to him. He's been my patient and became a great friend. And I've been preaching to him for as, ever since I met him. And he just, he, he's done everything. And so we, we took this group of Parkinson's patients because there's all this data out there on, on cycling and Parkinson's. And we put them in a spin class and showed tremendous improvements. I mean, stronger, three times as strong as the drug levodopa that they put them, their improvements in their Parkinson's symptoms wow. just by doing a spin class for 45 minutes, three days a week. And what was interesting is, this data had been done using in a, in a, on a stationary bike in a white walled room in a research lab, and they showed about a 35% improvement. We showed about a 60% improvement. And I'm convinced that the reason our improvement was so much greater is the socialization that a health club brings. And what I, that's why I think clubs are so important, particularly for certain individuals, just because they get a chance to get out of the house and meet other people. And, and, and in fact, when in our Parkinson study, when you talk to the patients who had been through it, mostly what they talked about was how many new friends they'd made and they had a Christmas party and all these things. You cannot discount the socialization that occurs in a club setting when you're exercising there, meeting people, the motivation of seeing others exercising. Um, I, I think it has the potential to have even more of an impact than simply going out for a walk by yourself or whatever, what have you. Do you think the, uh, the World Health Organization, when they were talking about the pandemic in its very, very infancy, early days, do you think they regret from a mental health perspective telling people to be socially distanced and they should have just been from the beginning saying physically distant? Yeah, I never understood that term from the beginning. And every time I hear it, I cringe. That is the stupidest term. I, who made that up? Uh, so, socially distant? Does that mean don't talk? I mean, it doesn't even, it doesn't even make sense. What is socially distant? It's physical. You need to maintain a physical distance. If you're in a club, if you're talking to someone, you do, doesn't mean you have to not socialize. You just don't get physically close. I, yeah. That, that term absolutely drives me crazy. Have you seen, and again, I love that example of those uh, cyclists and, and the, the Parkinson study. Have you seen any other studies that, that relate to socialization? Because I guess, in 2020 there's been isolation everywhere uh -huh. and and perhaps you know we come out of this and we go to a pub or a club or a restaurant or a cafe we get phys physically close and it sparks again I, I understand that but thinking ahead for our industry um it is part of this exercise is medicine um formula that socialization component as well yeah i you know i'm convinced that the salute let's face it the biggest problem we have is compliance and mm -hmm. it's not just with exercise as a physician i know you know what do you think the chances if i prescribe a patient lipitor today for his his cholesterol the chances that he's going to be taking it a month from now six months from now six years from now it's tiny I mean, it's probably some studies put it at like one in six, you know, for long-term compliance. And so when, you know, people gripe about it, well, I tell my patients to exercise, they don't do it. Well, they don't take the pills either. I got news for you. So, you know, we get so focused on whether, but, but, but clearly we need to improve the compliance of it. I'm convinced that it's, it's socialization that's going to do that. 
that if we have it be a social thing that's fun, you know, how do we get all these patients, are all, how do we get the world to suddenly be living on this phone all day and doing this, you know, we're constantly doing that. What, what was it that stimulated us to, to pick up the phone so much, to be constantly on all these apps and, you know, they're all social apps mostly, people spend a ton of time on. Correct. How could we sort of merge those fields? It's going to take a smart young person who understands social media and all of that to, to make this merger happen where I can bring people together around physical activity via the phone, but clearly the ability to socialize, there are lots of great social exercises. And if you think about um, when we were young, what did we enjoy the most at, at school? Probably most of us liked recess. You know, we went out and played, but we were playing with our friends and it was the social aspect of recess that we have great memories of. Yeah. And how do we, and it's, then when we got older, we took all that fun part away and it's just standing on a treadmill with headphones and pounding it out that, you know, most people, it's not appealing. How do we take it from the fun recess to the drudgery of, pounding it out in the gym and we just removed all the fun part of it. Um, that's what I think we have to get back. I love so that. I like I, that's, that is sports, a really... Adult sports are great, but in a gym, they ought to be able to figure out a way. And they, and they have, I mean, there's classes and things, but more of that kind of stuff that grabs people, hooks them in, makes them want to come back. And I think like CrossFit, that's why it's been successful because they sort of form like a family and a bond that encourages people to come back. I think that's a challenge for all gyms to find that formula. But it, but again, it has to be for, you got to get the people that need it, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, that really need to be there. You have the people that want to be there. That's all you have. And that's all you've ever had. Why? I don't understand the health club industry not going after a new demographic. So let's explore that for a moment. Um, you're wearing a white lab coat today. You see someone in a white lab coat and instantly you think professional. Um, knowledgeable, someone I can trust. <laughs> um, in a gym, we see people wearing hot pants, short socks, skin tight t shirt. Um, the image of our staff is important, but also I would guess um, for compliance, but also for the medical fraternity or al any allied health professional, I, I guess. To feel comfortable with us, they've got to know there's some sort of qualification, regulation around who they're sending people yeah. to. What are your thoughts on regulation of qualifications for people in clubs? Yeah, um, I clearly want somebody that knows what they're doing and there's got to be some standard. I sometimes worry about we, we need a bigger tent. You know, we need a lot of these people to help. Um, I, and I hate to exclude people who've got a real skill just because they didn't have the exact right credential. Um, so I, I think that's something that the health club industry has really got to think through. You know, what do we really need? At the end of the day, I just want my patient getting active. And if you can do it, I don't care what your degree is. If you can motivate them and you got that personality to, to get a hold of somebody and mo give them some motivation or connect people who all want to exercise together. I mean, there's just so many ways to do this. That I, that I hate to shove anybody out just because they didn't have the right degree. You know, I think clearly if I have patients that are very chronically ill, that have, you know, in-stage congestive heart failure, really poorly controlled diabetes, I'd want someone that could kind of be attuned to the symptoms, what they might be if, if these people are getting into trouble. But that's the rarity, you know, for so, the most part, I just need somebody that can help my patients get more active. So can I ask this question then? Would you think that's more important that someone has a higher emotional intelligence than actual intelligence? Yeah, I would say, yeah. yeah. I guess it's just tough to hire for that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right. So 2008, you were thinking outside the box. I'd love to know, love to know the looks on the people's faces in your press conference when you said exercise is medicine. You must have been standing up there and they'll look at you going, what is he? He can't be serious. <laughs> um, but you, you were out of the box when you, when you said that. And, and, and I think we're going to need out of the box thinking moving forward into 2021 and way beyond for our industry. Um, if you had the media in front of you, uh, let's say on the 1st of January, 2021, 
what points would you be hammering home around the idea that exercise is medicine? What 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 sort of points do, do the, the media need to hear and, and pick up those sound bites? Well, I, I think I would start with okay, we are now painfully aware of the cost of an unhealthy lifestyle. Here's the here's the casualty toll. And and for the most part, again, it, it, and you see this in every study, it is patients who have led an unhealthy lifestyle um, next to age, obviously increasing age is a, is a major risk, but after that, it's all diseases of unhealthy lifestyle. And we need to prepare for the next pandemic. You know, God willing, this, this uh, vaccine helps us bring this pandemic to a halt. We better get ready for the next one where, where we don't have the vaccine yet. And, um, and not only that, leading up to this, it's gotten virtually no attention, this epidemic of chronic disease. I mean, that's my practice every day is, is heart disease and diabetes. And, and I sit there, you know, patient after patient, why didn't someone teach you when you were young that you needed to be active every day and eat right? You're at a point now where, what am I going to do for you? And, and, and that's just patient after patient. And, and how this pandemic has just brought that to a head. But even after the pandemic, if the vaccine works, we're still left with all these unhealthy people that are going to be, you know, susceptible to the next one. And so we need to get this, we need to reverse this. We just can't keep going the same way we're going. And you, when you were talking before about compliance, and, and, and I get this whole concept that you're saying that we need to uh, get people moving for, the, for lifestyle benefits, but I can imagine many gyms are sitting here listening today or watching and thinking, perfect, I know exactly my next marketing strategy. I'll go out, I'm going to tell them they're and make them feel guilty that they're not doing something. When patients come to you and they haven't been taking their pills, lack of compliance, how do you appeal to them to change that behaviour? Because I bet you don't make them feel guilty. Yeah, I, you know, I try to explore with them why, you know, what's the reasoning, you know, um, there's often some underlying, you know, uh, I'm worried about side effects from it, or uh, maybe it's the cost of them, or, uh, you know, there are lots of reasons tucked in there that why they wouldn't be taking it. But I think that's the key is trying to ask them about why and explore why, what are the barriers to them being able to take this medication every day. And it's the same way with a health club or an exercise routine. What are the barriers that keep you from doing what you need to do? And, and let's strategize for a minute of what we could do to break those barriers down. But honestly, for most of us in clinical medicine, we just don't have the time and the expertise to really do that. that that's why I think I've advocated since the beginning, we need to merge the fitness industry with the healthcare industry. You know, I really need someone that has, I, I think the best we can hope from the medical industry is a sentence. You know, they've asked this exercise, vital, physical activity, vital sign. So I get a, a report that this person reports they're exercising, you know, 20 minutes a week. That's not enough. I want to tell them your blood pressure's up. You need to be doing 150 minutes. And, and I'm going to, I want you to talk to somebody who can help you do that. I mean, that's how we do, you know, we're used to referring patients. I'm used to, as a family medicine doctor, I'm used to, you know, I'm going to send you to the cardiologist and, and I'm going to help them manage, take this because I don't have the time and the expertise to take this the next step. It's no different with physical activity. You know, I can send them to a bariatric surgeon when they're, when they're overweight. I can actually send them to a nutritionist, but I can't send them to a fitness professional. That just doesn't make sense to me. You know, why have we bought off in all these other disciplines, but exercise has just been sort of left off. Is there anything in the fitness industry that you think could do to, to position itself to, to link more with the medical fraternity? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think we've, we've taken steps to have a registry of qualified exercise professionals that, you know, could perhaps accept referrals. Um, you know, the, the, the healthcare industry has been very reluctant to pay anything for it. That's been a frustration. We certainly have worked on trying to lobby that. I think those of us who, who who understand the value of physical activity, we really need to lobby to get this reimbursed like other things are reimbursed. Why is bariatric surgery reimbursed? It's <laughs> to me mostly cosmetic. Um, you know, why, why is that? I, I just don't get it. And especially when it, most of the patients seem to gain the weight back. And I, I've been very frustrated with that 
you know, as, as an option. Um, I, they'll, they'll certainly pay for diet pills that have oftentimes really horrible side effects. But yet, if you say, well, why couldn't I have this patient see a trainer and go to a gym and really hold them accountable? There's just that suddenly is not possible. Um, Do you think, you know, um, you know from and, and again, you, you have great experience from going to the Claremont Club because um, for want of a better description, that that club was not a sausage maker. It wasn't like you're no, getting hundreds of people yeah. come in. Yeah. A, a member would come in and they would be almost counseled or triaged when they came in with a, with a person. Do you think yeah. that is actually one of the keys for the link between the two um, yeah. people or two, so, uh, uh, what would you call it? Bodies, fitness and, and medical is that somebody actually talks to that that member when they come in and triages them to yeah. determine which way they should which route they go now they're in the gym yeah I, I think what mike alpert did with the claremont club he showed it's a viable financial option he made it work you know it, he he put a spinal cord unit he, he built a six thousand square foot studio for patients who were quadriplegic to work out in and it was a miracle. I mean, it, it, it supported itself. You know, he, he was able to get some scholarships and there was fundraising to help pay. Uh, he kind of did it as a, it wasn't making money. It was just almost a loss leader uh, where he was trying to just break even with it. But I think the goodwill it generated led to a retention rate in the club that was among the highest in the nation. I yeah. think people walked into the Claremont club and go, oh my God, this is amazing. I mean, I got a guy in a wheelchair rolling past me. I see him going to the exercise room for quadriplegics and people with ALS and other diseases that limit their mobility. And I go right next door and I'm lifting weights. It's just, it's just a great feeling. And if you looked at the demographic of the Claremont club, it, it didn't, it was a lot of older patients who were maybe not, they didn't look great in workout gear. You know, I think people were comfortable there. He was able to create this welcoming environment that wasn't mostly about people looking really good and having the latest workout gear it was just people went in there and exercised and socialized and uh, it just had a different feel than any gym I've ever been in. I love how you just use the word comfortable. I think that's a really lovely word to describe what a gym should be that in your wearing your medical hat, they've, they've got to feel comfortable. Yeah. And especially people who maybe are naive there to a gym, they haven't been there a lot. You know, they haven't never worked out before in a gym or never worked out before period. Uh, and they're and they're diabetic and they're overweight or they have heart disease or they've had breast cancer. You know, he created programs for all of these types of patients that drew them in. And, you know, he really it was one of those. If you build it, they will come. And they did. He just started them and they people at the club signed up, told people about them, other friends about it. You should join and join this program. And it really worked. The more I talk to you, Bob, the more you just keep giving little little golden nuggets and you just mentioned their program so perhaps thinking ahead for our our industry it's not necessarily memberships that we should be selling to the 80 percent perhaps it is programs yes for whatever chronic disease you're dealing with yeah we can help you here's our program for somebody with parkinson's disease here's and, our program for somebody with heart failure and wearing your wearing your white lab coat if you know that a fitness facility, whatever that facility looks or feels like, if that local fitness facility has a program for Parkinson's, you're more likely to refer them to that than another gym that has memberships. Would that be right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. That would be a very attractive option for me to know that they had some patients. They, they're, they're, taking, they're used to having patients with Parkinson's disease or with heart failure, or with lung disease that would be reassuring and make me want to refer to them. So I, I gave you the scenario earlier, the you're in front of the, the media in 2021. Now I've got you on the stage at uh, an international fitness conference full of owners and managers of fitness facilities. Your last question for today, sir, is this, what do you tell them? What's your sound bite <laughs> for them? Well, I think it is, again, the, what I mentioned before, why do you guys con continue to fight after the same little piece of the pie? You're stealing from each other. You're doing ad campaigns, just trying to take a few from your next door neighbor. Why not expand the pie? 
leave him with his and why don't you get more? You know, why not? Why aren't you trying to build a bigger pie than fighting over the scraps? I don't get it. And there is such a need here. And I think such a higher calling that you could have. You could aspire to be so much more, you know, and I and I talk about fitness professionals. Why don't you aspire to cure diabetes than help somebody look good in a bathing suit? I, I mean, I would think as a job, if I, I would feel better going to work every day, you know, worrying more about hearts and lungs than abs and buns. You know, I, I just think that you there's so much potential for gyms to really be a have a profound infect, impact on society. Aspire to that. Go for that. You know, be more than just selling a bunch of memberships and people come in and look good and, you know, really go after the demographic that needs to be there. And, and you know, the Claremont Club has proven that you can do good and do well, you know, in, in this industry. Yeah. I am inspired by what <laughs> you've just said. I, I love that higher calling. Thank you for pointing... <laughs> pointing the bleeding obvious out to the fitness industry, have a higher <laughs> calling and aspire to solve Parkinson's through exercise. That pure, diabe itself, pure diabetes. That's beautiful. That really is. Bob, I know you are, I've seen all the TV shows with doctors in hospitals and I know you're on a break. Um, I really appreciate the time for you joining us today. Um, and I want to thank you for your service uh, to the medical and the fitness industry over so many years um, and the foresight that, that you've shown and thought ahead. But more importantly, I want to thank you for your time uh, and your energy and what you're giving to your local community right now um, in the hospital because I know you're under tremendous, um, being stretched, tremendous stretching of resources and I really appreciate your time. But thank you for everything you're doing for your local community. Well, thanks, Justin. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk to you about something that I, you know, I feel really passionate about and I just know it needs to be done. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. What a great interview with Dr. Bob Salas. I found it fascinating how someone from outside the fitness industry was able to identify three or four key factors to getting people into clubs. He talked about the importance of them feeling comfortable. He talked about the importance of socialization and fun. And he talked about perhaps selling programs to these people who are being referred by allied health professionals rather than memberships. That to me was a golden nugget that we can all take away and implement in our businesses moving forward. I want to thank you for listening to our second edition of Thinking Ahead. Jason will be back in 2021. And if you know anybody that you think we should interview, somebody who will get our entire industry thinking ahead, then please drop us an email by going to fitnessbusinesspodcast.com, click on the contact button and tell us. And of course, you can see all of today's show notes as well at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. Until next time. What you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others.